This is Alex Honnold, and in June 2017, he climbed Yosemite's El Capitan without any ropes. This was the first man to make such a climb without any assistance. This was documented in the movie Free Solo by National Geographic. It's a wonderful movie. Uh, a little scary, especially if you're afraid of heights, but it, you really should watch it because this man's brain functions way differently than yours or mine. And I'm going to show you later on. Hi, this is Jeff Goldfinger, and welcome to the STEM Signal. This is where we help the STEM educated increase their career signal among the workplace noise. Now, let's get down to business. All right, so where should we start? Let's start with a little Tom Cruise. In 1983, he was in a movie called Risky Business, which I think has been voted the number three high school movie. In any case, that's the title of this episode, because we're going to learn how to judge your customer, again, at the broadest sense, internal, external, peer, superior, boss, uh, colleague, etc., how to tell whether they're what's called a risk seeker or risk avoider. If we look at the nearly 8 billion people in the world, they can be divided into two camps, those that are risk seekers and those that are risk avoiders. So let's talk a little bit about how the brain figures out which you are. So uh, there are three areas in the brain I want to discuss. On the lower portion, you'll see those three little blue sections. The one labeled AMG, that's called the amygdala. The amygdala is your fear center, and that lights up anytime you're afraid. The amygdala produces epinephrine, or adrenaline, as it's also known, and that is what heightens your body's senses and tells you to fight, fly, or freeze. There we go. All right, the other two areas you see in the lower part of the brain, that's called the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens, the VTA and the NAC. The two of them together cooperate to produce something called dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in, uh, involved in reward, motivation, and reward anticipation. So what happens in the brain is when you make a judgment about risk-reward, those two signals, the epinephrine and the dopamine signal, are sent up to that uh, blue area, that blue pie-shaped area in the front part of your skull. It's called the prefrontal cortex. And without getting too detailed about it, what happens is there's a little circuit in there that essentially measures, judges the level of those two neurotransmitters and then decides whether you're going to be a risk seeker or a risk avoider in that particular situation. Now, yes, sometimes you'll be, for example, you might be a little more risk taking at work than you would be with your family. So there's certainly some judgment on a case by case basis. But the truth is, as individuals, we can be characterized, no matter what the situation is, as mostly a risk seeker or a risk avoider. So I mentioned earlier that Alex is kind of unique in the way that his brain doesn't quite function the way ours does. So here's an image of Alex's brain. They put him in an fMRI machine. That's Functional Magnetic Resonance Imager, fMRI. And areas of the blood, when you're thinking about certain things, light up. So that's what we're looking at here in this fMRI. On the right-hand side is a control subject. And if you look at the crosshairs, where the crosshairs lie, that is the amygdala. And in this particular case, they were showing something that should produce a fear response. So that person's amygdala lit up, as well as other sections in the brain. But notice Alex's brain. The amygdala didn't light up. Now, that doesn't say that he's missing an amygdala, right? That, that would require a lot more research. Their speculation is that it takes a much stronger signal to light up Alex's amygdala than it does for the rest of us. So that explains it. So the question for you then is, how well do you know your customer and what clues do you have that can explain it? So let's go through a list. Let's look at what it means to be a risk seeker versus a risk avoider. So in episodes 9 and 10, I talked about the four behavioral types we have at work. Catering to the left, L-E-F-T, leaders, egoists, friends, and thinkers. 
Friend types tend to be risk avoiders. Leader types tend to be risk seekers. If we look at union laborers versus entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs tend to be risk seekers. Those who find pleasure in steady work tend to be risk avoiders. Now, I'm not making any judgment here, right? This is just pointing out the facts of how it actually works. All right, government employees. If I were to make a characterization, a broad sweep in general, right? I'm not talking about very specific people, but if you're going to profile government employees in general, they tend to be risk avoiders, whereas professional athletes are risk seekers. So some other jobs. If you're STEM educated in general, there are some exceptions, you tend to be a little bit more of a risk avoider, right? So lawyers, accountants, engineers, risk avoiders. If you're going to be in sales and business development, risk seeking. So you can sometimes profile people by the jobs that they're in. For example, in the military, we found that the logisticians tended to be the most risk avoiding whereas special operations are the most risk-seeking in general. And now I'm not saying the soft community goes out and looks for risk. I'm saying when presented with something that's risky or not, their brains will tend to light up for more risky opportunities. All right, if you're into the financial markets, index fund buyers versus equity traders, right? Equities, much more volatile. Index funds, not as much. Okay, I've already mentioned dopamine and epinephrine or adrenaline. Let's talk about two more neurotransmitters, estrogen and testosterone. So they tend to be called the gender neurotransmitters. The truth is both genders have both hormones just in different levels. So women naturally have more estrogen than men, but men do have some. And men have more testosterone than women but women still do. So if you're a high testosterone woman, you'll be a risk seeker. If you're a high estrogen man, you'll be a risk avoider. I've already mentioned dopamine. Oxytocin is another neurotransmitter. If you tend to be oxytocin driven, oxytocin is the love drug. Uh, Paul Zak talks about it in his book, The Moral Molecule, about how it produces trustworthiness but it's also the social drug. It's what makes us want to be around others and give each other hugs and stroking our partners, okay? Uh, if you're into personality inventories, NeuroColor is one. This is one I subscribe to. I'm actually a NeuroColor certified uh, trainer. So uh, Helen Fisher discovered NeuroColor, and what she did is she looked at the levels of four different uh, neurotransmitters slash hormones. So we have dopamine, testosterone, serotonin, and estrogen. And so I happen to be very high yellow and red, so dopamine and testosterone, which makes me very risk-seeking, and a blue and green tend to be risk-avoiding. So if you're high in these, you're going to be a risk-avoider. I'm very low, so this is the order for my neurocolor. Uh, Helen Fisher, by the way, in her personality inventory, a plug for neurocolor, uh, she actually validated the neurocolor using fMRI scans. Uh, some of you may know about Colby. Colby is another personality inventory. If you're a Colby uh, follow-through type, then you're a risk avoider. If you're a quick start type, then you tend to be a risk seeker. Many of you probably are familiar with Myers-Briggs, so MBTI. Again, uh, this chart by Robin N. I am not going <laughs> to take a a stab at how to pronounce her last name. I'll put the source in the description. So she put this really nice graph up depending on what MTBI you are. And I am for sure an ESTP, which makes me again, risk seeking. So everything kind of lines up. All right, so the key is to practice profiling risk tolerance at work among your colleagues. There are lots of ways to determine this somebody's bio, look at their history, how they got to the position they're in, their Facebook, their LinkedIn profiles. So lots of ways that you can profile somebody's risk tolerance. This should affect the way you interact with them. When you're going for somebody to support one of your ideas, recognize you don't want to come up with a risky plan when your colleague is a risk avoider. They're not going to support you. That concludes this lesson. 
If you found this content valuable, obviously I'd love for you to like and subscribe, but to increase your STEM signal, you'll find it more powerful if you actually recommend this to somebody by sending them the link or telling them about this channel. All right, thank you for joining today's episode and we'll see you next week. Let's get